This is going to be the best damn league show for whatever week that is. All you need to know, it's after the second week of the... No, the first week of the... Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, first week of the LEC finals, which I will say, it's the obvious thing everyone talks about, which is, I think maybe even Monty said it this way, it's like, I'm one of the people, right, who actually doesn't have a problem in general with the format, because I, I like sports like tennis, um, what, what else does it... I mean, StarCraft Brood War used to do it. We have multiple chances to win, basically. So that way, if, for example, you had a team, as it fully happened yet in LEC, I guess it did, Mad Lions last year. If you have a team that just catches a heater for two months, they can win and they get a championship instead of in the old system. They get like, you were good until week eight of the regulars, but then no one, no one remembers you, like Vitality in that two years ago or whatever, and you just sink that to the waves true, and you're yeah. never remembered again. So I don't mind it, but I will agree with this. The problem is, because they've made this part just about qualifying for Worlds. And even though they go, no, 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 it's about your seeding. People only care if they qualify. The problem is, this should be the ultimate championship. It's the season finals. But I don't actually feel like, basically, it really does seem like, I think the problem is people, essentially, you've made it, like, more important to qualify the Worlds than to win your own region in a way, you know. Whereas, like, if you think about how, like, the LPL design, for example, you need to win that. Otherwise, you're into, like, the fucking qualifier type thing or your second on championship. It's, it's like, it, make, it kind of, to me, the incentive structure makes you go harder in a way, you know. Mm. Whereas, like, for G2, basically, if they just come top three, they're top three. That's it. That's all they need. I will say the one bonus here is that it is the one event in LEC which actually has a stadium finals. Like actually That's good. Games. Yeah, yeah, that's so that, good. That's, that, that's, that's about the yeah, one yeah. thing I'd say. Now, I think a lot of people would view this format differently if it was a roadshow for each of these things which were yes. happening. It was summarized. That would be good. Obviously, that's not something which has happened in LEC. Like, I understand, like, if, they, if they're cutting back budget, uh, roadshows are obviously the first thing to go because they bleed money. Yes. Like, you have no idea. It, it can literally cost millions to put on, like, a yeah, it, yeah. Is, it is an absurd amount of money. So I do understand it from that aspect. And... I guess what that means is that almost regardless of stakes, just because the the semis and the finals, and I guess the Mere Masters finals is there too, but like that full weekend in Munich is going to be like the only LEC event in front of a road, uh, like a roadshow arena crowd in the year. Just for that, even if it had no stakes, it might be the most important event of the year. I mean, God, I'm, if you think back to you know the 2018, 2019s where every finals was in a finals, it was in an arena and stuff like that. And you had these big game players that always turned up in front of crowds. That's kind of what people would play for. They, you'd have these people which come alive during playoffs because it would be in an important location or something like that. Um, this is the one chance to show that now. So that I will say that's the bonus of the season finals. But then the problem is it detracts from the others because it's quite easy to snooze on like the smaller stage you've been yeah, on the of course. entire year. Oh, by the way, that's the thing that League of Legends, here's a reason, a, a totally separate but valid reason as to why LEC should definitely do road shows and big finals for all the LEC finals. Because remember, the one thing League used to have as an eSport was, we're the biggest, we're the biggest, we're the most viewers and the most money. Then explain this to me, League of Legends fans. How is it that in Counter-Strike, we make fun of the teams that can only win in the studio? In the sm There's two or three events a year that are just in a studio in Malta, right? And if you win there in front of, like, you know, the crew and, like, your girlfriends and that, like, 20 people in a crowd, we actually just sort of go, you're not a real champion, you can't be number one. And then we have, I'm not exaggerating, let's say, like, eight events that are in front of, like, a real stadium. Might just be the 5K crowd, and then you have the ones, like, right now, ESL... I am clones going on. The access, by the way, guys, can fit sixteen thousand or something when it sells out. Like Jesus. I've been in there. That is that is pretty sick. It's like Bono Stadium concert in like the O2 almost. You know, if you go to see like some rock yeah. band or something. So it definitely is a difference. So I, I agree. I think that's a fact that people do miss. Right, no, I mean, Here's the obvious starting. Right. Right? <laughs> I've got the gag set up for you. So let's see how I do it. Watch. Mate, G2 are truly on another level because what they've done that is so sick is one. They're too good. So they've decided we have to start behind in the game, make it hard, work our way in, test ourselves before we get to Worlds. And are you ready? This is top notch. By losing to Mad Lions, then we're going to come back and beat Mad Lions. Then if BDS somehow beats Fnatic, Fnatic doesn't go to Worlds. They've already beaten us. The only team that can really beat us won't even be at Worlds. Now our chances of winning Worlds have improved. Listen, GR, G2. I could be on your PR payroll. No one could do it like that, baby. So, no, for real, though, obviously, everything I said on the last episode, everything every prediction was, was like, Mad Lions shouldn't even be at the season finals, and there's 0% chance they can beat G2. So let's just start there. How did they beat G2? Oh, God. 
where do you even start? How? Like, yeah, I mean, because uh, you have to sit here when, you know, we're analysing these games. There is no way anyone would go back to that point in time and say, Mad Lions are going to win and this is how they're going to do it. And I still sort of feel like, they, if you ask me again now, will they win last weekend? I'll tell you, no, no. of course not. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. No, no definitely not. There, no. There, there, are, there are a whole <laughs> bunch of factors which go into this. I'm trying to think which even the biggest one is. Um, there's one factor which I think G2 did poorly, which Mad Lions did well, and this is very visible. So I think it's probably best to talk about the draft. Um, yes. Because this is where things got weird right off the bat, where... Um, you look at the champion pool for those of you that didn't see the, the series uh, somehow. Um, Mirwin played Lulu, Corky, uh, Zeri, okay. he was in his Smolder, bag, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then Aurelia top lane. Like, these, the Smolder pick is fire as well. That is fire, yeah. yeah. Like, all, all of these picks are just like, what, what, what the heck have you done? Like, the Nidalee, that last pick in the last game as well, I'm just sat there thinking, God, that was, that was like the season four OP pick when they, when they left it as the hybrid thing and they decided to bring those ratios back. Um, and I want to make it really, really clear here. When Mad Lions were picking weird stuff, they did it with a purpose and they understood how it was meant to work. That is the key thing which happened there. Whereas when you look to G2, um, when they picked some different stuff too, I mean, they picked the Vi'ari, which they haven't picked for a little while. So I'm not going to call that weird, but it's maybe not something that as practiced. Do you think on. they were experimenting um, maybe? Well, if they were experimenting, the problem is I don't think they came in with the correct mindset and the correct understanding of how those champions were meant to do. So because if you compare... Um, you know, the way that Mirwin was using, like, these these picks later into the draft, it came in with really high value. You can understand exactly what they were going to do. It was holding picks which you didn't expect to get flexed into a certain role to then change an entire matchup, um, which completely changed the game. And I think um, when you have stuff which is going into unexpected roles, like the Corky going top lane instead of anywhere else, the Lulu render being top lane, I mean, that was probably the weakest draft of all of them, but... Um, stuff like the Nidalee being weirdly a top lane pick as well, which means you can flex it between jungle and top lane. No one. That's is an old school fallback. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's like the season four and before. That's some shy shit. Thing. Yeah, the shy. Yeah, yeah. God, for those for those of you that really missed that thing, go back and watch season four worlds. Just in general, watch that tournament. Great tournament in general. It's a banger. Um, but I think the biggest thing to uh, talk about this is one, it does obviously allow you to pick some different champions. So you can pick obviously in the game five, it was the Vi, which went into the jungle and not the Nidalee. At that point, you can flex things around. But I think that a key concept here is if something goes into a different role and has a very good matchup or something like that, I don't think you should consider that the same champion as that same pick in a different role. Smaller yes. top lane into a Cassante is not the same as a smaller mid lane into a Lucian. Lucian is going to mess your stuff up, like yes. very early on. If he's into a Cassante, he's going to free scale. You can't do anything against him. You have to then dive that lane. So I think the way that you have to change your mindset is you see this champion in an unexpected role. It is actually a different champion for the way that you want to play the game. As now, in, the when you're the yeah. other side of the draft, you're not just thinking, right, they've got a smolder, so we can deal with this, this. Like, put it this way, I think this happens right now with all the Zeri mids. People keep acting yes. like it's the ADC one, and then they get torn up by it. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So um, it is the same champion when you rock up to a 5v5 later. Those late game 5v5s are like 10% of the game. There's 90% yes. of the game, which is your first levels of lane. It is the way that you're jungling around the map as well. Because what happens if you're laner? So for instance, um, when we saw the Corky into the cannon, Broken Blade probably didn't know what was going to happen with the first few levels as well as Mirwin did on the other side of that. Because he knew that he could control the first few levels of that matchup in a different way because Cannon is actually very poor against anything that outranges him. Which is why I think actually Blind Pit Cannon... Maybe I'll talk about that in a bit later from G2 side of things. Blind Pit Cannon, I think, is an absolute sin. It's great as a counter pick. Do not pick this when people actually have flexible champion pools. But that doesn't just impact Broken Blade's lane. It means that, yes, he might lose the lane in a way that he didn't expect to. It means that Yike then doesn't have a winning lane in top lane, which he was supposed to. Cannon's meant to be a lane bully. Oh, actually Actually, no, it's not anymore because there is an unexpected lane matchup there. So if you combine this across all five games for Mad Lions, um, the biggest thing was when they were shifting things into unexpected flexes and for some reason got red side for like four out of five games, which is for me unforgivable when they showed that they were doing this flexible kind of last pick random change across the map. Um, Mad Lions knew what that would do to affect the early game, affect jungle pathing, and in fact, uh, impact like just the entire game state from that point. And G2 didn't. So G2 was sat there not really understanding the full implications of what was happening there. Um, whereas when G2 were picking stuff that was a little bit different from what they were doing as well, I don't think they were even picking this less out there stuff with the correct mindset to understand how it affects the game. Um, so for a quick example of this, um, 
when Cats played the Aryan games, he obviously is a special champion of mine, so I don't understand the matchups well. One of the biggest things we knew about when um, Ari was last played to Vex, when it was last in meta, is that you kind of need to take some different runes. You kind of want to take Bone Plating instead of maybe the mana runes you take secondary. So you're taking stuff which helps you deal with Burst in lane, because Vex is a very, very bursty level 1, level 2 champion when her passive is fully stacked at the start of the game. Caps didn't do that, and he lost that early lane. Now, that didn't actually end up leading to that much of a difference in that game, and they did snowball that game. But there are little moments like that where you can see that maybe G2 didn't have that lane understanding and the overall understanding of what would happen with these lanes and how it affected the game compared to how Mad Lions did on the other side. That's probably the biggest individual difference between the two teams. There are other things, but like, I think that unexpected flexibility and honestly, the sheer volume of random stuff they had prepped with flex picks that we've basically oh, not course. seen anywhere yeah, yeah. like it's absolutely insane i think the special thing about mad lions is that they came up with like a it wasn't just one bullet in the chamber this was like a full magazine of random stuff to throw at gt which were all really well prepped we saw a little bit of this winter a lot of this in winter from mirin when he played you know the um yeah, yeah. six top which he was using into the he was one of the original ones to play virus if you remember stuff yeah, like that exactly. yeah yeah it was uh that, that was, i think that was cooked <laughs> up by the machinations of kerberos and solo queue for those out there and okay. that was a good guy i like him a lot um he's an erl player but uh mirin was the guy that would come in with powerpoints to describe how his champion should play in lane and how that would affect the team that is really good. And you can see if you do that enough and you work that into the way that you bring takes to a team, it can genuinely shift things, not just in a best of one where you just randomly cheese stuff. You can actually do that for a full best of five. So for me, biggest thing first is that flexibility, which I just, how, how do you expect that kind of flexibility? It's absolutely mad, you know? No, I think it's actually what a genius angle I hadn't thought of because one of the f things that's funny is I actually thought Merwin had like speed ran the fucking Adam arc where you go from having this idiosyncratic <laughs> style to co I think I think I actually have a theory as to why people do this. It's like an actual psychological theory. It's that when everyone tells you, "Yeah, I guess you're good and you beat me," but only because you did that off meta pick. It then, like, reverse psychology playground style makes them go, no, I can play meta stuff too. And then so all of a sudden you get to the summer and he's playing, like, Renekton, Cassante. And it's like, bro, what are we doing? You're Merwin. Like, your whole shit always was you had weird picks. Mm. And, in fact, I always thought the genius in winter was, yeah, true, sometimes he would sort of be a glass cannon. But it meant you could make comps, like you're saying, no one had ever played. No one, no one had, like, no one would be quite sure. It's like, actually, do we shut that down? Or does he just get that many kills in lane? And does it fuck up with the jungle interactions? And so you come to the season finals. I agree with you. He's obviously the one where they've just said, like, just like Jesse, <laughs> we need to cook. Yeah, just go. We're gonna go for. In fact, they're cooking like at that fucking that season where the guy goes. Oh, I can only do ninety six percent purity of the meth or whatever. And they go, but he can do almost a hundred. Like that's what you were trying to do. Because I, the reason it's genius is I, the reason I always back in the day used to love the VCS region and the old Gigabyte Marines is because if you're Gigabyte Marines, you could never actually beat an LCK team straight up. But I tell you what, if you do like a lane swap when lane swaps don't exist and you have to get the kill or you screw the whole game up, they've never seen that, bro. They're not, Koreans are not doing that blue. So that might bizarrely steal you a B01. I mean, everyone knows probably yeah. ANX, the most famous one ever. They beat fucking Rocks Tigers. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, that should never have been ever possible ever, but it was because they just went completely out of the meta. So in a way, first of all, props to like Melzer, props to Merwin, if indeed he isn't just a guy that picks it, but he can even explain what he's going to do. I would even suspect, by the way, in that, since he's ahead of Adam like I don't know that Adam always can explain what he's going to do in the game or when he's going to push and when he's going to group I think he doesn't know himself always you know so this is actually well played in that sense and the reason it's actually cool is this because I even though I thought he was overrated in winter I'll give it up to Super now I know why he has that ego because he's the one guy even when their team went to shit actually sort of kept playing and kept getting kills and kept trying to carry games and you saw when the team actually came together around him in these games he could carry him it was actually in position to carry some of the games. Like, what's funny is, even though the narratives, you know, when you set up a narrative on Shaw's Nightmare, if you've been setting up a narrative for four weeks, part of you doesn't want it to be ruined because it's like, ah, oh, fuck, I was working oh, on that. that work you know? I did. <laughs> but here's the thing if you're actually a true fan of the game and it's a banger game, you don't give a shit in the game. You throw the script out the window, you just get into it. So, actually, when I saw how they were pounded on GTA, I was like, fuck it. I hope they do win the series at this point in time. Like, just keep rolling. In fact, I would have been sad if G2 had just pulled it back at the end and just won the game five, you know, like, in some yeah. ways, you wanted them to complete it. 
Also, they sort of punch G2 in the face. Like, I'll tell you what, it's uh, it's kind of ironic because I don't think if you go back and watch that Fnatic Cup of Bracket in summer that they really beat G2. I mean, even in the games they win, G2 could almost win them, right? I think G2 was fucking around. They were also trying some things, experiment with the draft priority, took away picks that were clearly strong for them. They were essentially putting one arm behind their back. This series was actually someone not only beat G2, but someone said to Dylan Falco, would you like to play a game? And actually beat him straight up. And in theory, remember, no one's supposed to be able to do that. He's supposed to have all the fucking Exordia Pokemon, isn't he? Like, uh, did whatever that was, fucking Yu-Gi-Oh!, just for all the kids, people, everyone's going mental already type it. It's Yu-Gi-Oh! the Exordia, wasn't it? Whatever. But that's the craziest thing. He was actually beaten in draft, bro. Well, remember, it was the whole Dylan, we've got to go Vayne. This is like that times 10, if you look at the actual picks and what they were doing there. Like, Vayne mid is like, actually, that made like a lot of sense, just in terms yeah, of the yeah. individual lane counter pick. These things were like completely out there. And you know, like, sometimes you take things from solo queue and you think, yes, this can work. This was like a different level compared to that. And I think when it comes to the whole, yes, I'm, you know, we're glad that uh, Mad finished this off. I think how the opinions on G2 as a team have shifted in the last kind of month or so over these series, which they've had in terms of the, the last three. Um, people, I think, were waiting for G2 to lose and they wanted them to lose because G2 deserved to lose their first, oh, their yes. last three series. Yes. This is just the first series where the enemy team actually deserved to win. That's the only thing which saved them in their last series yes. before that is because when they were up against these other teams, when it was like BDS and, and Fnatic, they just deserve to lose just as much as G2, and G2 just managed to clutch it out because they still are quite clutch players, um, of course, when it comes down to it. But, you know, serious credit to Mad. I think also um, another thing which we have to kind of redress at that point too is a lot of people were saying that Mad didn't deserve to be here at the season finals because, oh, they just won that. Sure. You know, they were just finals in that winter split. Does that really matter? What You know, what what's up with this? Um, yeah, no, they, they've showcased that actually they do have the, the at least the current level of form to be here. Now... The way that they got to this point, yeah, I understand the winter season points and blah, blah, blah. And the Adam Bench and all that jazz, yeah. sure. And, and particularly given how Kami Core were playing at the end of summer, I can un I can understand Kami Core yes. fans like, oh, of course. being upset of that. And, you know, actually, just before the season finals, I was sat there thinking, yeah, actually, probably Kami Core does, does, deserves to be there for Mad Lions. But, you know, credit to them. This is an incredible series. By the way, um, an obvious thing you could do that they haven't thought to do is you could just take the last championship points and have them play each other to get into the season finals because then if they beat Kami Corps up, no one will ever complain. I always say that. I don't mind if you beat me in the game and upset. It's just if you get the yeah. points, then someone can, then I can just complain about the points, can't I, you know? <laughs> yeah, so um, obviously that's like the first big pick into the first big talking point between the two teams because it's like it's an easy thing to compare between the two teams when you have like one team that's pulling out all this weird stuff and G2... Um, I think there were some key moments, and just to really hammer in, one of the bigger problems that G2 have had um, over the last few series, again, is that sometimes they look for engages, and in this series, they bit off more than they could, could chew, and that was punished even harder because of the way that Mad were, were drafting as well, because there were games where they had legitimately, like, three carries or three AD carries, because they had one on top, and in jungle, and in, uh, not in jungle, and in yeah, mid lane, yeah. and, in, and in AD carry. Um, so there was some, some really big problems when it came around to, say, like, the game four, when they were using the Orianna Nocturne combo. Like, if you are using three ultimates and having a Kai'Sa flying to kill one AD carry, that's great. You have now used three or four ultimates to kill one AD carry when there are two remaining. Um, so I think it's moments like that, and moments when I was saying in terms of like, just, like, some of the laning understanding, which was falling apart too, which really put G2 behind, and they couldn't coast through this series. And I think... They have been coasting a lot recently, um, and a lot of this is starting to get really, really concerning for me. So if, to, if we're going to turn this conversation over to the side of G2, side of this too, I think that particularly Broken Blade had a, has had a nightmare um, beyond the... the just. The By the way, also... Even though normally I think he does fine, like he sort of just does his job in the team of fills where he has to, and he tries to step up when he does, he doesn't. That was a bit of an, e an ego fucking Aurelia pick for a game five, bro. Like that was like you're in yeah. your head doing Roy of the Rover shit there, really. Just because that was because that's his classic champion. Like that was a that was a bridge too far for me, mate. Come on. Yeah, but <laughs> so so they're they're earlier. I'm like, okay, you're trying to out weird pick the weird pick and like be a yes. and lane. At least at least I can understand that. The things which are actually really problematic for me were when. Um, G2 were on blue side and assuming they could blind pick something for Broken Blade and they gave him like the Cassante, which then had the Smolder into it. Well, Cassante yep. hates that and Smolder stacks for free. Uh, before that, they had um, the Cannon blind pick. Was this three games in a row? And yeah, the first game ended up working out, but even then, BB had like not the best early game in terms of that early lane on the Cannon. But then it's into the, the Corky and the Zeri. So he was sat there playing out the Cannon without that winning lane matchup and he didn't really end up playing those lanes particularly well either. But still, between draft and then the lane understanding, I think Broken Blade has probably, over the last few series, um, 
of the ones which they just scraped through. Probably had his worst laning performances I can think of ever in terms of a streak within EU. Now, this is coming off of the fact where he's had his best laning performances ever at MSI, where one of my, my biggest talking point coming out of MSI is that G2 are good enough at lane to actually threaten Eastern teams. And that's very, very rarely happened out of oh, EU. Typically, not, yeah. EU have, typically, EU have won against Asian teams when they've had like a cracking jungle path early game where they managed to snowball the game or something like that. We've never really seen like a straight up fist fight beat you through lane, beat you through conventional League of Legends in terms of like just raw mechanics versus mechanics um, from lane. So now seeing Broken Blade come from that high down to here now, I have some real worries about this team because actually when we look through to further matchups as well, now actually suddenly G2 have to consider um, is the enemy top laner going to get away with their laning phases more than they should do? Or actually, can they punish Broken Blade now to a point too? We have to consider that going into future matchups. So uh, there are there are some cracks that have been shown from G2. And I think also this is a culmination of G2. I think they slacked off in summer. Um, I think that um, I was a, I was worried that they would be ex some of their weaknesses would be exposed um, because they were not really tryharding, and that means they're not really playing the League of Legends that they want to, which means that actually when it does come around to the important series and they are pushed, what kind of information do you have to quickly fix these things? These should be things that should have been addressed for way earlier in the split, but you haven't necessarily been setting up for yourself uh, for success with that. So, um, yeah, when it comes to it, Mad Lions, they absolutely deserve to beat them in G2. I think I have particular issues about top lane, and I think the last point which I'll say for this too is I also think there is a continuing problem now with Yike in the jungle. I don't think he's necessarily doing quote-unquote badly. I'm just afraid that Yike is not determining the pace of the game anymore. Knowing this player from the ERLs and how he played on LDLC, he was a player that was like a macro linchpin. He would be moving around and ordering his uh, his mid lane and support around to get like really crushing um, ganks onto mid lane to get a snowball mid ahead, go into the enemy jungle, get farm advantages. I feel like Yike has been crowded out of this team in the way that he should be playing the game. And it means that um, you can see some games like, for instance, game five, when he's on the Zyra versus Elio's um, Vi. Vi should never be competing in farm with the Zyra because Vi is not a farming champion Zyra is. But because I think Yike is now playing um, as a resource for his teammates, and he's playing too selflessly, he doesn't take that selfish option. I think that Yike has potentially left himself particularly in this meta where jungles are so strong, without a lot of resources to play the game in the way that he wants to. So that's probably the last thing which I'd say about them too. I think that Broken Blade's lane understanding has been not great recently. It's probably his worst string of laning for a while. And I do think that Yike has struggled to take control and actually add direction to the game. I think he's just adding on to what other G2 players would really want. Yeah, okay, I've got a few things. Like one thing is that this is where I don't want to totally put the old tinfoil hat on and invoke Le Conspiracy. But I also do feel like coming into this series, G2 didn't expect to be tested. And I actually wonder if they really did like either do their due diligence or if they even were trying to experiment themselves. Because one of the immediate things I thought once we got to the end of this series is I was like, what is it? Something's missing. What is it? It's, that, it's the dog that doesn't bark. What, what's missing? And then I looked back. Bro, where the fuck is Cap Zeri? Anyone who watches the LPL right now knows if you have a player like Caps and you can get him onto it. They had one game, by the way. It wasn't even banned. They just didn't pick it. They had one game where they were on like the, the what was that? That's insane in the LPL. That that pick is a fucking god when you have it on like a top, top player. So that already makes me like, why why are we, like Caps was going to a more traditional champion pool, if anything. And then also in this series, because they've had those two ridiculous series against BDS and Fnatic, yeah. in a stupid way, I almost feel like G2 think they can just be behind all the time. Because let's face it, even when Mad Lions won, they were still fighting most of the time. They were still getting kills. They could still sort of make the fights up close. I mean, one of the things I think's fooled everyone this year in LEC, and this is actually, in my opinion, the biggest factor as to why LEC fights looks like shit and all the LCS people go, ha, 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 and bang on them. Even though, by the way, everyone except Team Liquid would probably get murked by all of our top three. Easy. I think even Kami Cop could murk fucking FlyQuest. They'd go head to head with Cloud9. The reason why it looks messier when you play in LEC is everyone opts into these like triple ADC comps. And as you've seen, I mean, you cast all the LPL games, mate. That just makes fights absurd anyway, because you really do get fights where like no one can really mentally calculate who's going to get the kill off and the damage. Or And so you get these fights where like it's like the joke of like, I think I've got you cornered, but then you turn around and you're the one who kills me. It's like, what the fuck? Whereas in the normal five to five, we all and our brains sort of can do those quick calculations of like, right, if I keep track of him. And so as you say, like for the example, like people 
overusing the ults even. That's some noob shit. That's, again, if you have one ADC, you know when to get that off. If three, you do it at once. You've actually you just entered the whole fight. You can't when yeah. there are three of them. How exactly. That, that's them? the genius. Whereas in your brain, you've been trained all of League of Legends. You kill the ADC and the fight is over, isn't it? Well, not in this fucking matter, especially considering what did it cost to kill him? And then lastly, if we're talking about ADCs, brother, Hans, where have you been, my dude? You even got Draven. Remember when everyone was scared of Hans Sama Draven? Yeah, this is an example of what you were saying earlier, mate. It goes the other way too. Sometimes old picks in their real role aren't the same pick. Draven ADC ain't the same, mate, when everyone's got an ADC. I'm shit scared of that if it's, if it's the only ADC on my team. Yeah, that's going to be a fucking powerful... I feel like right now, mate, that would be the most killable ADC ever because everyone's got all these tools to get... So I feel like... Also, Hans Sama, by the way, has just had a bit of a nightmare year all in all. Like, it hasn't been a great one for him, has it? It, he's definitely not been at the level which he's been at some points before. I think that, you know, obviously parts of Spring, G2 were like the one team that were playing kill lanes, or was that Winter? Look, earlier in the year. I, Winter, I, I think, yeah. Exactly stuff. Yeah, Winter, before MSI especially, like when it was all Draven, all yes. Blister and, and whatever. Um, I will say, yeah, I th I w I'm not going to point too many things at hands, because I also think that Mickey has had really bad on lane understanding too, which is, God, that 2v2 has been all over the place, and I think that... Um, I was wondering whether this was a Mickey problem, whether it was actually Noah and Jun doing very well in the finals and just smashing them in the early laning phase. You know, you can see that, um, you know, obviously Noah's gone on to have some really good early games, so I think that's definitely a factor. But yeah, Mickey, Mickey's particularly in lane, making a lot of mistakes alongside Hans Sammer as well. So they're not really getting the 2v2 advantages that they're doing. And if you're picking for a lane advantage and you're not getting it, that's a problem because like that's where a lot of your power budget for these champions and how their balance and design goes around so also um, by the way if you think yeah. historically of every hans sama team they clearly always want hans sama to have a lead in lane that's like one that's like checkbox number one for him and his team so it's all the reason why i also think they're playing with fire generally in g2 they keep getting behind every game yeah, and um, particularly when that doesn't just drag Hans Sammer down when something happens in that lane as well, so he doesn't have that lead and he can't play as like boisterously with a Draven with like a Bloodthirster shield just running forwards and throwing axes. It also drags down Mickey as well, so when then Mickey's behind because he's lost his flash and he's down like three kills or whatever, and also Yike has had these aforementioned problems about him struggling to challenge the direction of a game and actually add his own impetus onto it, your jungle support are both struggling at that point. Yeah. And any top tier team, actually I just think any team in the League of Legends is really driven by jungle support in terms of the macro right now. Even if it's using that to facilitate a top lane or a mid lane or an AD carry, whoever it is, jungle support is the heart and soul of macro. You cannot do something without them working very well. To the point where, you know, in LPL, I think probably most games are won because one jungle support is is ahead. Now that is obviously influenced by laning states and sure. whatever, but because because bot lane's not going well, support's behind. Because Yikes kind of struggling to put his own direction in, and actually top lane's losing lane more yes. now. Jungle's behind as well, so that means that your in fact your jungle support's behind, and then you bring that back. To if the people don't know, in the series. LPL, so many games, the team that's leading is just the one that gets the kill off in the bot lane early. The one that gets that off, just they have control of the game at that point. Yeah, well, we've we've had um, a whole. Yeah, I think we've had you know. Two, two five game series in the last couple of days. We had a four game series today. I'd, I'd say, like, I don't know, all games, but like one or two were determined by one team, like, getting a huge early advantage and then just rolling yes. through jungle. Jungle advantage yes. was to help the rest of the team because, like, their support can roll more easily. So that's definitely something which I've been cutting on to more and more in, like, on this current patch. Um, and then I think uh, probably the last thing which I'll talk about here too, because this affects every other matchup too, is Aurora has of course been released on LEC. It's on all um, playoffs patch of every world's qualifying region now too, so it will be enabled at worlds compared to um, using rather uh, Riot's logic for when a champion release is enabled at international competition, so it should be available because it was available in all world's qualifying regions in their playoffs. Um, G2 are batting Aurora on blue side when they have the best mid laner in the league. It can also be played top lane as well. If you're the team that is meant to be experimenting and it's meant to be cooking, you should be practicing Aurora and at least showing that you can use it. If you're banning it on blue side, never mind red side where I think it should be banned, I think you shouldn't let it through to be a first pick, that's a huge problem too. That's one of the things where, you know, you were mentioning that, you know, RG2 experimenting. I'm starting to lean towards no, because there are a couple of these discrepancies. I'm like, well, maybe they're experimenting with XYZ, but like, definitely not with the Aurora. What's happening with this? We've seen this be absolutely 1v9. It's 100% presence in the LPL right now. LCK has had some more middling results, but we've seen people like Keen play it massively well in top lane, so it's not just a mid lane pick. PCS has been loving this pick too, where it's getting, you know, 1,000 damage a minute games, like, every time it's picked from mid lane and elsewhere. Um, 
the fact that G2 were going back to the AP mid laners and not playing the AD mid laners like your Tristana or your Zeri or, or your Lucian or whatever, and of course, no, the patch has changed. I'm not saying that all of these are as strong, but the Aurora is really strong. Why the heck are you banning that on your blue side? Like that, that to me is a is a bit of a, a telling factor. Um, you know, in, in the other series that we have between Fnatic BDS, like that wasn't banned, but that's for different reasons to me, because I think that actually was an experiment in its own way. But for this one, like Aurora, I think should be a first pick priority for a load of different teams. If you're banning it on blue side when you can first pick it, I don't know what the heck's going on there. That to me screams not ready for this patch, especially when you look at the post finals interview from Mickey, I want to say. I think Mickey was saying, oh, we were looking for the most powerful picks on that patch, which is 1413, I think it was. Um, and we didn't know exactly what was going to be our power picks, what would be our blind picks, what would be our first pick opportunities. I think it's pretty obvious, though, on this patch, though, which Mickey said he was looking forward to, and the team was looking forward to, Aurora has to be one of them. I think you've got stuff like the Rumble, you've got stuff like Ezreal, you've got Aurora, a couple of these picks. You need to be re willing and ready to pick them. The fact that the Aurora was banned on the blue side is really quite worrying to me. Right. Obviously, something else people do miss in life is securing their devices, whether that be their phone, computer, whatever it might be, other things, I know, tablet. I don't know if you can put it on watches. Maybe you can. I'm not, not a scientist, am I? Just a guy who's reading this ad readout. So here's the thing. If you go online without a VPN, like ExpressVPN, that's like getting undressed with your window curtains wide open. Even if you think you have nothing to hide, why give some creep you don't even know a chance to just peek in? and see your crown jewels. That is something we say in the UK, by the way, Americans, look it up. That's all those euphemisms you need to learn about. All you need to know, by the way, when you find out that's our euphemism, you'll find out maybe we don't actually revere our king and queen like you imagine, because you're stuck 300 years ago for some weird reason. So ExpressVPN reroutes 100% of your traffic through secure encrypted servers, so even your ISP can't see your browsing history. So it hides your IP address, makes it extremely difficult for third parties to track your online activity, see where you're going, what you're doing. By the way, that actually might increasingly in the future become more and more valuable, especially because key concept for you, so this is me speaking now, key concept is it doesn't actually matter if what you look at now is fine. Your problem is what if your ISP is logging it and in four years that becomes not fine to look at that material. That's when you'd be in trouble, isn't it? It's actually the thing about the internet a lot of people haven't thought through. It's easy to use. I actually will say I've used loads of EPS. This is the easy one. Yeah, They've made it as idiot proof as possible. They genuinely have put a giant like Dr. Evil style <laughs> push this red button and it's on or off. And, you, and also it auto connects to like a, re, a like an obvious server. So you don't even have to fiddle around with that. So if you're not super tech literate, don't worry about that. As I said, it does work on all sorts of devices. So you can also stay private on the go. I think Monty says he puts it on his phone when he goes through their ports. It was rated number one by tech reviewers like CNET and The Verge. I've used this one many times, especially when I was in a, a really large Asian country that sort of taught northeast on the map. And, you know, VPNs are very useful to be there. Monty just I says explicitly. I used to watch the Olympics. There you go. I wanted to watch the BBC Olympics coverage, so I did. It's very By the way, that's actually also a low key, a thing that has become, you'll notice these last couple of years as an expat, it used to be so easy to watch everything. Yeah. Now, like, I admit, the Euros are a nightmare for me because everyone's posting everything clips from the UK and everything. it's all... You probably have the same thing. And it's this like, content is it's not available. And you're location. like, oh, I want to click it. I can't see it. So obviously, this nope. is exactly where this is perfect. You pop that on, then you watch, look at the tweet again, look at the video again. It'll all be working. So yeah, I've used it myself. I think it's obviously key to... Uh, I think the tracking thing, like I say, will become more and more and more valuable. So... Protect your online privacy today by visiting expressvpn.com slash league show. That's expressvpn, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash league show. And you can get an extra three months free. See what I did there? English. Inglorious bastards. Look it up, right? expressvpn.com slash league show. I actually wasn't even aware, by the way, until that movie, that that is a thing that gives away that you're English. So the joke is, anytime I meet any German now, I'm going to go out my way. Three of those. Three, sir. Three. Whatever. whatever. <laughs> anyway. Let's do the Fnatic BDS series now, because this is another example of one where... I, I, I foolishly said on the last episode, 
Maybe it would have been better if BDS had played in the final. I wanted to see BDS for that kind of best of five. Well, I spoke too soon, didn't uh, I? Because the yeah. problem is, BDS, unironically, haven't done anything in a playoff series since fucking spring. This is mental at this point in time, bro. Like, it's actually incredible they managed to finish third. They haven't done. They haven't actually looked good in any series ever beyond a few lane leads against G2. And if you look at this series, I'll tell you what's a big bomber if you followed BDS all season long, which is actually one of the most stable parts of their team is Nuke. And brother, he woke up and thought he was caps in this fucking game. What was he doing? He go 1v1ing against Humanoid. Like, if I'm playing against Humanoid and I'm like the opposing coach, I'm telling Nuke, Nuke, perfect, mate. Stay in your bag. Let this idiot think he's better than you. We're just going to basically neutralize him in lane. And then when he gets out, he's going to roam and do one of those face checks on a brush. And we're going to catch him. The last thing I'm going to do is feed the mid lane kills because already you know fucking Razork's going to gap Shio. Like, the, the game plan here, normally BDS is good at the game plan they just mis-execute or people don't use their hands or something like that they actually look fundamentally like something like I think some of them lost their head in this one mate like I can yeah. put I can give a lot of credit to Fnatic in a minute but some of these BDS players have just lost their fucking nerve or something and you know BDS, I'm trying to think how many best of fives they've lost over this year now like, they've, won, they, 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 <laughs> they, they've won one best of five and that was versus Kami Core, and that was a 3-2 but they lost like the G2 best of five back in spring they lost versus uh, they lost versus Fnatic and versus G2 in winter they lost versus uh, Mad yep. and they lost versus G2 like they've, they've done a lot of losing in best of fives and yep. I wonder just whether I wonder just even though, um, because remember one of the things we led the show out with is saying that actually one of the big things about this format in the season finals is that, well, you do get that arena finals for the semifinals and the finals and it's in front of that big crowd. Dude, if BDS made it there, they'd, they'd just liquefy. Like, they just turn the jelly. If, they are, if they're performing like this yep. in a best of five in the LEC studio in front of 200 people... This team goes to Worlds, this team goes to like Munich or, or whatever. Yep. I'm really afraid what would happen to them. You know, I was afraid of what would happen to like Noah in front of a big crowd sure. because of his his own, you know, like mental collapse in the finals and whatever. But like, this is this is like historic levels of collapse considering how well BDS were playing in the best of ones and some of the um, some of the best of threes. So I, I don't know what the hell has gone inside the mentality of this. And I think that shows, yeah, it does show up in players like Nuke a little, a little bit. I will say, I, I can understand you feeling a little bit desperate when you've got a top laner and jungler performing the way that they're doing. The fall off of Adam. It's crazy this year, isn't it? It, it is. Dude, you would think that. If, you, would, you would actually think that, like, he's in Tenet or something and his career went, like, up to the, like, 20, like 2023 and then it went backwards now because he's regressed. Bro, I'm not joking. I actually thought at the beginning of winter he was really good. He looked like he was going to build on that and become, forget all the yeah. god shit, he was actually just going to be one of the best top laners. And then he's just gone backwards and now he's actually doing that solo queue shit again, mate, where he just gets caught like an idiot. Yeah, because, um, well, last time I was on the show, um, we were praising Adam for kind of graduating from that champion pool where he didn't need that anymore because he used to use those things to make sure he had side lane presence because he can 1v2 and 1v3 and stuff like the Darius or the Olaf or whatever and you had to then like rearrange the map to, to deal with this. You didn't deal with it in the way that you did normally with side lane so therefore BDS have the advantage because Adam has this specific champion pool. Um, it doesn't matter what he's playing now. Adam's had a historic fall off. Like this is genuinely one of the you know the most interesting, weirdly high level top laners that we've had in EU. Down to someone you you can't trust in team fights. You can't trust him in side lanes. You can't trust him in laning phase. I don't trust his champion pool now as well. Occasionally he has himself like an Orn game where you know he gets value because it's hard not to get value yes. on Orn if you survive that laning yes. phase. Like okay, cool, you survived. Press an ult. Sure, that'll do something. That's what he's been reduced to. That is. That is really painful. And then... The idea Adam you can't play that. Cassante as well. Like, brother, everyone plays that. Yeah. Come also, on, dude. By the way, you know, you know, the pentakill he got on the percent Cassante as well does not excuse the rest of that no, Cassante of course game. Not. Even back then. Of course like, not. Like, 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 look, it's a fun moment. He had that one good fight, but one good team fight and one pentakill does not like a good player of that champion in the meta make. You need to have the legwork and you've got to get, get the... Um, kind of get, get the reps in before that. So... That that was a huge issue. I want to ask and you I, a question, yeah. Nymero. Yeah. How would you evaluate BDS Game 2 draft? Because if you ask me, right, tell Thorin, design a BDS draft. First things first, I uh, want ice on like one of the strongest ADCs in the meta. Like, this is like a draft for Adam. This is a draft so Adam can yeah. style an everyone with Camille. Like, the, in this scenario, you've clearly given him the platform. Well, yeah, no, that's that was one of the things I was going to reach towards at some right. point. Because it's like, because it's like, okay, well, maybe you're flexing things around, and maybe Adam could do well on the carries. Maybe this is just something he needs to do. Maybe it's just the tanks which are a problem. Obviously, 
that wasn't the case. Something else is the problem. And yeah, I think that um, whereas teams like uh, Mad Koi and teams like Giant X as well, I'll credit for this, yeah, true. Too, have, found, have found an identity. They know what they're good at, at least. BDS, I think they had that identity, which is like, let Ice chill until he's a long-range carry in the late game. Maybe something like a Jinx that can reset and just give him... He is a safe pair of hands. Everyone else can just organize the map and we play clean up until we get to the point where we can 5v5 and play through and you can ice as really good double backline carries. This just isn't it. Look, I know that Ziggs is very powerful right now, but it's not in the same way that ice tends to look towards. This was something which cropped up to me, actually, in the back of my mind um, when we saw ice playing stuff like the Twitch earlier earlier in the, in the, in the playoffs as well. Why the hell is Ice playing Twitch? That is not the way he wants to be positioned. Ice should be stood behind in a double front line with like Shao and Labrov yes. or, or Adam or whatever, yes. with like a long range carry, something like that. Twitch wants to be on the flag. He wants to be an assassinated carry. That is not what I want to see out of Ice. In the same way that I didn't really want to see him on the Kaiser, where, you know, like he he did finally get that win on the Kaiser in playoffs too, but it's, it, he was something like one and seven on that pick or something. But I, I don't know, it was, it was a really um, bad like um, track record on that point. But yeah, going towards like this. This draft on its own for BDS, which was the Camille, Sejuani, Lucian, Ziggs, um, Leona, that is a good wombo combo initial team comp. If you took the nameplates off and be like, yeah, I'd give that to a bunch of teams in the LPL. I'd give that to LCK teams or whatever. That is a good meta team comp. There are ways you can play that well, and the lanes aren't, aren't bad either, especially when you've got the Camille into the Cassante um, and, and stuff like that. that. That's good stuff. But as soon as you turn the nameplates on, it's just not the agency to ice which I want to see. Um... And I think that is giving too much volatility to Adam, who has not dealt with that volatility well either. And, you know, this was a game where, you know, BDS somehow, they, you know, they this was still a game which they ended up getting towards that Baron and they threw around that Baron too. So I will say they did probably play it better than I thought they would do. I think Adam getting those early kills in bot lane helped cause Oscar in and then got a like, huge farm advantage so they didn't, like, blow out the game or something like that. But you, you could see that BDS trying to play for this long-range combo. It wasn't really Ice kind of being that safe pair of hands in the back line. Really affected the way that they executed um, the team fights. This this was the most egregious game of the in terms of gameplay of the best of five. This like this is one which they absolutely should have won and they didn't. So that there is that caveat. But even with that in mind, this isn't the draft which I wanted to see. And I think that um, between stuff like Adam's understanding of side lanes and his play around side lanes going down, his just individual lane fight and team fighting going off as well. Obviously, a lot of that is individual underperformance. But then you combine that kind of, well, they're not playing the side lanes well, they're not executing well, and actually their drafts aren't looking too shaky, uh, too good either. You know, one of the things that we mentioned the last time that was on here as well is that we thought that BDS's coaching staff deserved a lot of props. Of course. I think it's only right now, actually, at this point. Um, and it, look, this is this is the blessing of the curse of talking about coaching staff because we don't know exactly their role within things. We praised the coaching staff. We decided to do that. Now I'm deciding to trash them for this Just one too. What the sure. hell are these drafts? What the hell are these side lanes? What the heck's going on there? Now, of course, there's every chance that this is completely independent of that. This is an Adam problem, both in the positive and the negative. But whatever's happened as an overall team um, team dynamic here, BDS um, pressure in the best of fives, individual level of performance has gone through the floor. I think Shao has also been wildly off form and i think the saddest thing about that for adam and shao being on really low form i actually think labrov had a good playoffs in this series wasn't even bad for him too they have basically wasted labrov's return back to a good level of form with the top jungle like falling off a cliff at the same time because labrov we know how good he can be as a support and particularly sure. with eu support being not great it's sad to see this uptick and this upswing be wasted like that being as I've so hard flamed him, I've even told him literally on Twitter, Twitter to just get the fuck out and go back to Korea. Not that he'd, he'd be in a challenger team. I have to give it up to Noah. He actually did play a lot better here than he yes, did in that so, infamous final. So. I mean, first of all, he actually sort of like showed a little bit of humility. Like he didn't just E forward all the time randomly on Ezreal and just get his ass caught and look stupid. He sort of played within himself. And as a result, he had an excellent series. No complaints there. Because one of the things coming in is, I always want to build this as this should always be the five game series. BDS against Fnatic should be like should be. hands against brains. It's the classic matchup, you know. It's even like the styles are different. Like Fnatic's the like skirmish all over the map style early. BDS is like we group around the objective. We try and catch you out and punish you. In theory, if you do that right, that's like an amazing MMA match right there where it's like perfectly Time matched Time is a flat up. circle. Yeah. You know, like CLG, you versus Fnatic or Yeah, whatever, or classic. <laughs> yeah, Moscow 5. But then the problem yeah. you have is this. If you looked at the strengths, the obvious strength to me was like, look, 
Oscarinen's not like their best in lane, but Adam's going to give you free chances, so you're going to have an edge there. But then, okay, I think Ice is better than Noah, so maybe that can be an edge there if you can get to the fights. But when I came to do my bet, I just straight up bet on Fnatic, because what I realised was, even if those factors did play out, the one area I could never in my mind, I was doing the, like Doctor Strange, let's see all possible futures. And in none of those futures did Razork ever lose this series. That's my problem. I tried to think, no matter how good Ice is, it's never going to get past what Razork's going to do in the early game. And that's why I did think it was just beautifully brought up in Italy in the game three as well. Like, that's the Razork I yeah. want to see. That guy actually is just a fucking stud. D didn't didn't when um, Fnatic, uh, when they beat G2 as well in the best of five, Razork, I, I think like the coach was saying like, oh, you should probably go for this pick or whatever. He's like, nope, going to Italy and just locks it and he just like slams yep. that game. I think... When you're a Nidalee player, you kind of have to have that confidence. If you're not feeling yourself in Nidalee yes. and you're playing a half-hearted, you're not actually playing Nidalee, you're playing Jungle Soraka. You're playing for like a late-game heal on your E and you've done nothing up until that point. So yeah, um, we know that Humanoid and Razor can be very ver variable players. We saw the upswing of them. Fantastic series for them both. And, and yeah, I think really is worth hitting again on how the fact that Noah... In his previous series, good early game, couldn't capitalize late, and has some, you know, historic throws. So obviously that doesn't invalidate yes, those. Yes, of course. Um, he had like one moment in that game one around the dragon fight where he nearly died, uh, like randomly by diving in too far. But he still actually managed to um, judge the knife's edge there too. Yeah, I think it is only right when when you put someone on that pedestal and say, look, you played crap in that best of five. He had a really yeah. good series here as well. It is fair to do that. And I think that if you can continue this level of form, I, this is what I want to see from him. At the end of the day, we are here to see good League of Legends. Yes. If he plays like that, I'm happy. Everyone should be happy with that too. So um, the fact that he managed to have really good early games again, transfer that into a fantastic late game and actually be a much safer pair of hands um, was really important. And one particular play which I'll shout out as well, he made a really good move in that second game, which a lot of people focus on the Baron throw there. The reason that Baron got so tense, and I will still, still put the onus on to Shea for mis-smiting this. There was no smite on the other side of the table if you look back to that Baron steal from Fnatic. But what Noah did do is something which is normally something you see from a misfortune on a red side draft. So if you think about misfortune, how can she how can she thread in a Baron fight? Obviously, she wants to put her ultimate across the entire Baron pit. It is much easier to do that when you're on technically red side because you've got that barren wall protecting you. The terrain actually protects you as well. I think this is actually something which isn't talked enough amongst kind of like league analysts in terms of like the actual terrain of the game affecting how champions play from one side to the other. Dragon fights are sometimes easier on blue side, sometimes they're easier on red side. Some champions want to play on both. Misfortune really wants to play Baron fights on red side because you've got that wall protecting you most of the time. People can't just walk at you. Noah's a blue side misfortune. So bearing in mind what we just said there, he doesn't have that wall to protect him. Except he goes out of vision and on his own gets into position to ult across the Baron pit from out of vision. BDS don't see it coming and they're being attacked by a quote unquote red side misfortune position because they've, he's still used that wall skirted around the enemy battle lines and he's got himself into that position to ult the pit. And because um, he's in such a good position, no one's in a position to cancel him or particularly kill him. And there's another fact as well about Misfortune, which is, so this is a weird thing. People sometimes forget that Misfortune's ult can crit and he has an oh, infinity nice. edge. So the, each nice. wave of her ult can crit, he has an yeah. infinity edge, which means it's empowered crits as well. It's not high crit chance, but when it does hit that 25%, right. that, that shit hurts. You'll notice when, this, when the Baron's getting burst down by the ult, everyone's getting shredded. The first two waves, I want to say, don't crit, and they do about 600 damage. Then one wave comes in and does like a burst of everything, and it brings down the Baron even lower, which means that Shao, even though there's no smite on the other side, is dealing with a misfortune that is positioned in a way which is quite hard to, um, to cancel out. He's afraid for his own HP bar, and he's not expecting the crit coming in from the misfortune, as well as there's some damage coming in for the Kassansei, that he ends up missing the smite. Misfortune can be really, really hard when you're already under stress like that. And I think a lot of that happened because Noah actually positioned himself very well, well, I don't think it was particularly an intuitive thing to do, but he did it very well. So I'd like to praise that um, from him there. We'll also still just say, though, there still was no Smite. Smite's show had Flash, could have just backed off and flashed back into Smite range. He could have played it better, but the fact that Noah improvised and ended up making that play work for himself is definitely a play which I want to call out. Um, and it, yeah, overall, the best best of five we've seen from Noah so far. And that really helps because he's been really good in the early game. I think it's part of why Fnatic... Fnatic are the best early game team in EU right now. Oh, and a lot of that is actually coming through just these great laning performances across the board.
This is a question I want to ask you as somebody who's watched all these LPL games. One of the things Same that way. I keep piping <laughs> is, I don't just think people should celebrate Razork as like a great Western jungler. He actually has the hands and the feel. Where, dude, I actually think he could give you some like BO1 upset in that Swiss system. You put him against like the right LPL team, the right LCK team, he could mix it up. Like I could believe he could outhand some of these guys, man. Um, I think when you're looking at people who go beyond best in the West or best in the EU or NA, and then you go to terms of, well, okay, what's their potential elsewhere? You, I think the key factor for me is seeing how a player can take a seemingly small mistake and make a game-changing moment out of it. Now, we saw that from Humanoid versus Cream at MSI, where he played the LeBlanc, and there's a particular thing you can do with LeBlanc where if the enemy pushes the wave in but doesn't get the full crash and it stays outside the enemy turret, LeBlanc jumps over that minion wave and tries to poke you down time and time again. Now, that's how Cream ended up getting blasted by Humanoid. Um, yeah, so that, that was like a great moment for him showcasing that skill set. I think Razork is another kind of player who, if you place your wards wrong or he has like a good read on uh, where jungler is going, he is one of the players which will find the most creative path to get into a lane or get into the enemy jungle to find good fights. I think that, yeah, I think, I think Razork is the single jungler in EU which will take the game by the scruff of its neck the most often and take a small moment in the early game into a game win. I think that Elioia used to be that person, but I think Razork is is quite clearly um, going to be that player now, which also makes the, the next round, of course, like Fnatic versus Mad. If we've got Elioia in form and then Razork in form as well, yeah, maybe we'll see a bit of vintage there too. But Razork, um, you know, it, it, also a thing from him too is that very occasionally we, we've seen both him and Humanoid even beat out G2's mid jungle when they were playing well too. There was that one. I can't remember if it was the best of one or the best of three, but um, just before they led into it, apparently G2 lost their entire scrum block to Fnatic, and then they got on stage, and then like Razzlek on the poppy absolutely monstered them in this huge play when Caps was playing the Ari, and they had like the poppy to Leer. So I think Razork is one of those players, much like Humanoid, which can kind of like uh, see that like that thread, thread the needle of that one mistake made by the enemy team, which they might not even think is a mistake, or they think it's small, and actually ride that into a victory. So yeah, I think that I think that Razork is quite clearly the best jungler in EU right now. I think that particularly with Yike taking a, a huge step down in terms of his own way to determine the game, and Razork being on form, he's definitely worthy of that decision. We'll put the caveat in. Razork sometimes just a bit does a bit of dirty inting too. I'm not saying like this guy is yeah, yeah. the, the especially in the late game. There is there are some bits of that that one brand combo uh, against G2 was was not it when he stood in that brush but yeah I think that that's what you get with Fnatic you have two players which are very very good at kind of seeing that opportunity and threading the needle to take that one mistake and then take games like that so yeah I think that there are definitely ways I could see a Fnatic at peak taking random games off of very very good teams in the lower bracket. We have a matchup that we saw as a BO3. We saw SK play. Oh, no, sorry, SK play Fnatic, actually. We, we get the BDS SK matchup now, right? Which is in a best of five. Now, here's the problem both teams look like they've tanked. So, I actually, on this one, I feel like this could just be a fucking slap down, drag out fight. Who the fuck knows what's going to happen with this one? Like, like, think about it, right? I don't even know at this point in time. Essentially, the only player on these two teams I can rely on is irrelevant from SK. That's about it. <laughs> Aside from that, I don't feel like I can rely on any player in the... Maybe Lavrov if he gets his shit together. Like, I feel like everyone's at their worst right now. So it should be a competitive matchup. But which, which side are you leaning for this one? Oh, God. This is, this, is the mic this is the matchup which gives me a migraine. I think even in the GX G2 game, I actually have like some solid logic for why that <laughs> okay. matchup could play okay. out in like, some ways. Like, I actually think that GX could have an angle. Yeah, yeah. We'll okay. get to that when we get to that. But this one, I'm just like... Look, what the hell's going to happen between Isma and Sheo? Both of these players are, like, susceptible to level 1s yes. if either team comes... If either team preps, like, a handful of okay level 1s, this series might just be one off of that. But also, if it does go beyond that, I think both of the junglers have been really poor at executing a lot of the big 5v5s later into the game. I think that's one of the big reasons why BDS um, couldn't find their own big team finds. I think SK versus Kamikor, that was that was probably the biggest reason why they, they couldn't beat them, where... Kamikor had developed this style where they would absorb and engage and then they run it back at you. Well, SK were just throwing crap engages. It made the absorb absorbing the engage even easier at that point, where Isma would just randomly get caught and then just go in as Maokai and hope for the best. So, jungle matchup is one which I'm really worried for both sides, and because they're so key to the way that they initiate team fights, I... The, the matchup analysis could actually end there at the worst case scenario, where actually everything else just, like, fades out. It's just about, well, okay, which jungler is, like, executing poorer today? Um, yeah, I think that SK have a really good mismatch in top lane right now with Adam's laning phase being so bad. So, so bad. And irrelevant, um, you know, he can play stuff like that. Camille, much better than Adam apparently can right now. 
I don't trust Adam to counterpick something like a cannon in the oh. way that Mirwin did against against Broken Blade. So I think that the cannon probably is now a power pick for for relevant if he wants to play that too. So yeah, I expect laning phase and then team fight impact to work out from top lane um, for SK. And I guess the other bonus as well is that because we haven't seen SK for a little while now, they will have had some time to prep some different stuff and to okay. not show anything themselves. So I think some of the little X factors here are leaning towards SK. So for, for instance, you know, um, speaking of that top lane matchup, what if Irrelevant can play that top lane Aurora, which we haven't seen any yet? Maybe if Niski um, can play it as well in mid lane, I... I don't know what to make of Niski on playmakers like that. I'm not exactly sure. After that Ezreal game, he threw historically as well um, against Carmine Core. Definitely one of those champions where I'm like, okay, give him three dashes. He might use them to go in and completely throw a game away. But I'm, I I think with all of like the mini X factors, I would probably favor SK in terms of like that real mismatch in top lane. It is a real conversation, though, particularly in jungle, about... Who actually works out better from this? Shea or Isman not being under as much pressure because they're opposing number isn't doing as well. They're really important to their team. Technically, that takes the fire off of both of them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that one of them is going to benefit like hugely from this. I still think both junglers are struggling. Here's the thing. In theory, when I try to analyze, I look at the players. I do think, in theory, SK should win. I actually think BDS, the difference is, BDS has looked bad a long time. SK, like, half would look good and then throw the game, right? But I have to say, even though I agree with your analysis, I refuse to pick Niski to win a best of five until he proves otherwise. This motherfucker is like... I actually think for real, because he got through the early years of criticism, then became pretty good, and then became like a great teammate, and then sort of like willed rosters that people didn't think were that good to better finishes and a bunch of finals. He's in one titles. I feel like everyone's forgiven him, and we've been giving him a lot of rope. And spoiler, he's used the rope, as you might imagine, in Minecraft to win a life. Like, this guy, it's criminal, some of the ints he does. He does some of the, the craziest straws I have ever seen, like solo queue level stuff. And it's weird because he's a mega veteran. And he seems like a player who's vocal, you know, like, it doesn't seem like he's got the... I don't think he's doing it for ego. I don't know what it is. He just does... He, just, he actually genuinely creates it. So it's one thing, you know, when you just make a mistake. He sort of, like, finds in it when, it when I didn't even know... It oh, reminds yeah. me of Hillisang when he would be at his worst, you know. Well, they just, they find an angle I didn't even know existed. What about Noah? I mean, Noah had, like, these crazy sure. early games, massive kills, and then he threw it in the late game. Niski has done that, like, a million times before yes. books. Like, there was that game versus Weibo where he was against Shao Hu. Goes like, that was eight insane, kills yeah. up when Silas versus yes. Ari. And I sat there thinking, like, oh my yes. god. This is an unplayable matchup for Ari when he even gets one kill. He's got eight of them. This is unlosable. And yet, he finds a way. So that was... That was historic in its own right. And, you know, I just realized another funny thing, too. Because I was saying, well, you know, BDS, they've only won the one best of five this year. And they've lost the other guys. SK haven't exactly the best of five exactly. This year. We exactly. don't even know. Even though even get to that in point. two splits they are flat to deceive that they would get there and they never do. They never oh, do. Oh god. And yeah, you, you look at like their regular seasons as well. And, they and, always you know, tease they, you, mate. They're yeah, so they, they, they're they, so they, outrageous. They were, oh, like didn't they in even in winter they started off three and oh and then yep. in summer they or like or, or whatever yes. it was, and then they ended up third because they slumped a bit. Then in spring they I always say season. SK is my old school flying saucer I want to believe poster. I so want to believe this team could be good, but I tell yeah. you what, I'm just sick of getting my heart broken now, here. I'm just yeah. fucking, you know. <laughs> One of the saddest things about that too is because, like, on, on all levels but gameplay, I really like SK. I yeah. mean, um, I know a lot of people find their content stuff. I think Laura, Laura Linardi is fantastic. Their content, and of course, as like an org as well. SK, they like, have Crepo has killed it with the yeah, GM in the yeah, last few years. With little uh, budget, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I, th and I think I actually speaking from speaking to Swiffer as well. I like the way that he thinks about the game. We've I've had some good gameplay related conversations with him, and also just as an org, SK are like one of the OG oh, of like gaming yeah. things ever. Like all they need to be like that you know, more in the public eye and have that community support behind them. It's got some freaking results. Yes, absolutely. Like, where are they? Make it's a final like at least. Is. Yeah, exactly. Make yeah. a final. You Give know, us a sweat. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I just, I just want to see, like, if they can make it through these best of fives and actually show that they can be a best of five team. Because if they can't even do it in the best of threes, where, like, you know, the calming core best of three that they lost uh, in playoffs was, like, game one, yep, easy. Game two and game three, well, they were definitely not good in terms of their execution, in terms of their early players or in their team fights. So, I don't know. Hopefully the team, the, the time off's done some well for them. Maybe the patch change has worked out well for them, too. Maybe Niski can go over to something like the Aurora or, or something else. 
um a little bit more mage like in the mid lane which works for him and and maybe that'll be the difference but this is the problem now we have two teams which are not but they are not best of five teams one of them has to win and that's only because the other one is going to be worse than them and that that feels i'm not judging this by the strengths of each team necessarily besides maybe irrelevant i'm judging this by okay who's going to put the du enough duct tape on the vital components for long enough in the g2 gx series before you get hyped, because I actually think there are some... They can win a game or two. But here's the one factor that is immediately interesting, which is if you were G2, you don't have to worry about any of that top lane flex pitch anymore. Like, look, if there was ever one team where I can tell you... I can already predict the three picks that top lane's going to take in this one, right? At least that's going to be stabilized. Like, Broker Blade, just get back in your original bag, get the normal pick out of picks. You know what top lane's going to be. And obviously, ev all eyes on Jackie's in this one. It's all eyes on Jackie's. But I tell you what, though, one thing I like, it's one of the reasons I also hype him is, I don't even think it's just that, like, he can do a pop-up here. Bro, I actually think he has that, like, what I actually call, not even in the derogatory fashion, he has delusional confidence. He actually thinks if you give him these picks, he can, I think he thinks he can beat Caps in a game. Not in a series, maybe. I think maybe even he'd sort of, like, you know, fail the lie detector on that one. But I think if you asked him in this game, you give him a draft, could you win? I think he'd be like, yeah, I think it's possible. He plays like it, which I like. And this is where, like, um, this is where probably the... A lot we of got a crazy theory the craft coming from me. Come on. I, I, I genuinely think G2 could be in trouble here because of the patch change. I genuinely think there are options here because okay. you were saying that there are three picks for top lane which come through, and I agree they're going to be the Orn, the Rumble, and then maybe something like the Poppy, maybe the Zac or something like that. But largely it's going to be the Rumble and the Orn, which are champions, which Antonio is not going to smash you in lane the way that Mirren yep. does. But he will get out of lane potentially with those picks and influence team fights in a way that yes. you can't answer in the same kind of way. So that is still a danger. Now, take those picks off to the side here and say, well, they've got three of them. We can ban most of them away. If Aurora gets into the hands of Jackie's and Jackie's shows that he can 1v9 on this pick, which we have seen in other regions right now, that needs to be on the ban list for the rest of the series probably. And G2 are already doing that. That's one of your three bans used up. So if you use that, and then maybe you actually wanted to ban away the Amumu from Jungle or something like that, that's actually been something with Shine X have been doing as well. And then you have to ban away the Rumble and the Orn as well. That's actually four picks there. We've already got to four at that point. I actually think with the patch change, if G2 don't drop the Aurora ban and learn how to first pick it, I think Giant X could get themselves their comfort champions. And also then factoring in that Broken Blade, while I don't think he's going to get countered in lane, his laning performance hasn't been great himself. I don't know whether he's going to be able to stop Antonio getting for team fights. Imagine that phrase. That's Broken crazy. Blade is not going to stop Antonio getting to team fights. You'd think that would be the other way around yes. in any other iteration what year is of this. this. I, maybe I'm on just like the hopium of all time, okay. the hopium of all time. I genuinely think Giant X could run away with something like a 3-1 if the drafts are poor enough from, from G2. That is genuinely the timeline that we're in. Now, of course, G2 are a team which are very, very good at taking losses and saying, well, that sucked. We'll fix our drafts for the next time or whatever. But I think particularly when you're looking at Giant X as a much more conditional team, and as we mentioned earlier when you we were talking about you know, Mad Lions and then kind of criticizing BDS for not doing this, they know what they're good at. They have triple tank engage where they have like the Orn, Amumu, and then something like the Ral, Alistair, which are like the triple tank engage from top jungle and then support. If you then have this extra champion of the Aurora for, for mid lane or top lane, I mean, I doubt Antonio would be playing that, but particularly for that for that mid lane, I wonder whether these combos are going to be more freely available to them, because Giant X looks very practiced on them, and this did feel like a kind of team composition where Giant X were playing them because they were good at them, not just because it was just like a cheese thing or something like that, because I think it allows um, Juhan to just like be this kind of big go button and allows him to play the game very confidently which i don't think he was doing particularly without that so if he gets himself you know sejuani vi uh amumu and just kind of gets those snap engages with everyone else and actually they get all of their key picks <laughs> call me crazy i actually think giant x could really throw to g2 for a loop because g2 don't have that x factor themselves of saying well we'll just smash to you in lane oh we'll just play it magnificently like this if Caps isn't playing the way that he was smurfing, you're not going to have that X factor. If your bot lane and top lane are having this misunderstanding in laning phase two, that can also be a huge factor as well. So, um, barring Caps, you know, having his pop off performances and um, bot lane kind of getting getting a, a, a like a too big of an advantage over Patrick, who's not actually been that great, and of course Dignar as well, who's not necessarily a learning specialist. Yeah, I think Giant X are at least taking a game. Yeah, I think, I think it's plausible. I mean, for a start off, again, I already saw it against Terex. I want to see the Jackie Zeri. 
Let me see that pick. Yeah. Lock that motherfucker in. Because then then I'm just sitting back with a fucking cork and a bag of chips waiting for the game to play, mate. Especially because here's why it's also going to be awesome if they can actually get some like actual picks out of lane, mate. Because G2, has, I agree with you. One of the things G2 has just not pulled, the, they haven't fucking reeled it in from when they were just a dominant team. Is they still do that shit where like even when they're not actually ahead and they don't actually have tempo on the map, they just like invade your jungle and start like trying to start a fight with someone and then do that shit I hate. It's cloud shit where you like backpedal out of the fight and just lose people one by one as you run away it's like why do you even start it like in that scenario like again it's like you it's like your brain of where your comfort zone is has gotten really really warped and out there and now you don't realize you aren't you aren't that guy anymore like you have to rein it in a little bit because the stupidest thing is i do feel like at this point in time dylan falco actually could just go the other way and just go you know what I, i've never thought of doing this but let's just band-aid the team and play really meta basic league of legends like surely we just win if we do that but I don't think they're going to. Like, the other thing about this team is, this team does have a little bit of the spirit of the G2 Super Team in that you can tell they sort of also like to get their juices going with, like, a weird pick now and then or try, like, playing a non-conventional thing or doing a crazy play together on the map. So I do feel like they... I agree with you. They're going to... Not only are they going to give GX a chance, but if GX get the right draft, they can win a game here. They can win a yeah, game. So, the yeah, dream so is they I, win the first game and then we get a little little bit of hype going, you know. Yeah, I think I think if game one goes to Giant X and then it changes the bands afterwards, so like stuff starts cra like dri dripping through because they have like one or two extra weapons, like like of course Mad Lions did. They they just brought out some extra champions which G2 didn't know how to deal with, particularly when they were put into different roles. I don't think Giant X are going to be doing that because let's be honest, Antonio is not going to be playing lane bullies and weird shit. He's going to play his. If people don't know, he's yeah. probably the most defined player in the history yes. of European League of Legends. Yeah. Not even but as a dis. He just knows his job and he yeah. just fucking does it. And you know, honestly, <laughs> huge credit. You know, he came in to replace Otto Amne, who was, of course, like one of the all time greats of the top lane role for EU. Yep. And like the cons common consensus was this is for Spanish. Yeah, everyone thought it was a meme. Yeah. It's a meme. Yeah. He'll be the it's worst like, top player. It was like, this was supposed to be his gold watch at the end of his career playing in Rex, yeah. essentially, right? Yeah. You know, like he's been play he's yeah. played. For, he's, he's played for like exactly. what, eight, nine years or yes. something. It's like okay, you get your chance at LEC. Yes. You can say you are now an ex LEC player. Exactly. And he has definitively not been the worst top player no, in no. the LEC. Absolutely that not. is the bare. The, that is like the bare minimum you can you can give him. Anything more? Bro, than that is like I'll give it, I'll give him there. even more credit. And could you imagine yeah. anyone traveling back in time and showing me John Connor this fucking video? Bro, I actually think if you put the Antonio on BDS, they would probably be better right now. Yeah, usually so. Yeah, it's not even actually, a diss. I'm picking actually, that team on purpose. Oh my god! Actually, he'd be such a bad yeah. for them because he's such he'd a be good mega. player. Just a, a, bare, a bare minimum, he'll survive an impact team fight. Yes. And that's exactly what Adam is not doing. Exactly. He's not surviving. And he's not impacting team fights. God, what a world! I can't believe is. these sentences are being said, but they are. This like, is real. This is real. And I have to say, so this is probably this is like just a, a bit of a tangent in that sense. I think this has been the hardest split slash maybe even entire year to predict in the entirety of like LEC yes. that at least I've been around for. Because part of it has been we have a load of our top teams like randomly falling apart and players doing whatever. But like even bottom teams have actually put together some decent shouts in yep. terms of the matter. Like the, I can't think of another year which has been as hard to predict what's going to happen, particularly because at least at least when typically I get something wrong in terms of prediction, I've had some of the right logic. Yeah, sometimes yeah. I'm just, just the I'm performance just not even, I'm not yeah. even reading from the same book at some point. Like, no, no way no. could you predict what was happening with Mad Lines. And I think the worst thing, well, the worst slash best thing is as well, like we were saying with the Mad G2 series before this, there is no reasonable way you can expect an analyst to predict that as well. Oh, you know, in points in the past, you can predict these great upsets because of X, Y, Z. And, you know, I think Rogue, when they won, made their title run, at least there was some logic there, even yep. though it was unexpected. Right now, like, I can't, I can't even pin together the logic of what's happening with the next, the next bloody day of games. It's so hard to choose, like, um, which players are going to sure. be on form, but also what they're going to be prepped in their off time. It, it does make it exciting in some ways, analysis. Also gives me a bunch of migraines, but hey, yeah, that's part of the job, I suppose. Yeah, that's also the other thing I don't think people have given credit for in LEC. Because they saw the arse fall out of the top of the league, and now even G2, they're ignoring that. What actually changed, though, is the bottom of the league showed up. Because I'll tell you what, GX and Kami Corp were a meme all year. They made roster moves, and now they both found their identity. And if they had have both been here, actually, 
actually could they could have mixed it up in this fucking format. Like it is, it's why it's funny. We, we're going all the way back now to 2013 because famously after 2013 Worlds, right, that was the year when yeah. all the NA teams thought they were better because they played the right way and they thought EU played the wrong way because EU just did the usual. It was just jungle mid basically. Who gives a fuck about like ADCs, etc. And what I remember doing an interview with Doublelift after like Worlds when EU had mad outperformed NA and he just had to admit and he actually had one of his most lucid moments ever and he said a line that I actually think he nailed something deep and abstract about League of Legends. He said, basically, there is no best style. You play the best style for you. And I think that is what he nailed. So that is what these teams do. Like, if you see the way KC was playing, and you could criticize all their top side recruits, but because they played in a predictable way, it made the game work. You can look at GX and you know what? It would be a travesty if this team made it at Worlds. They would not be able to do anything at all. Oh, but I'll tell you what, they can so win <laughs> They can win individual games off everyone. Everyone. Yeah. I agree with you. They could, they'd get off Fnatic. But they could get off everyone one game, in my opinion, at this in this LEC. Yeah, but I mean, I, I feel like that, that thing which Jebelif was saying there is, you know, that was mirrored when um, 2018 Worlds came around and Vitality had, you know, the Yamato speech when he was talking about, you know, like, play your own League of Legends, don't just conform. This is something where in every sport, this keeps coming up in other ways. It's the whole, sure. when you imitate greatness, you can only be an imitation of greatness. You will find this everywhere across any creative or competitive field. This is just something that happens. The reason why things conform again is because it's so much easier to see a working example and work from that. Sure. Building your own base from zero is really hard, especially in a game like League, which has been going over for time after time. Um, in fact, actually, a good example right now would be, um, so I'm going to use Kennen as an example coming back in top lane. Kennen is a champion which comes back every year or two because he is a lane bully which deals with tanks in a way which T people just kind of forget about. And he has like this very particular way of like engaging in very unique ways from top lane. Uh, Evelyn used to be like this in the past. Old Evelyn used to be where, you know, it was Diamond Prox and, and Clear Love and all of these all-time great junglers who'd use like that passive invisibility from level one to do things which you just didn't expect. If you don't play against this stuff, lane swaps as well, of course we saw that in the spring. If you don't play this stuff for like a year or two, people forget about it, and then people have to then kind of conform to it yes. again and stuff like that. League, because it has so much random ways to play the game, always goes through these cycles and these cycles can overlap they can be separate from each other so notice as well connected. another thing that people always forget is the second and third order effect which is every time yeah. a certain champion comes back a counter comes back that might not or in otherwise have been strong in the meta that's so there's also if you get ahead of that you can sort of be a step ahead exactly and that's why um you know when we saw the lane swaps coming in you had to start looking back to the veterans that actually played in season five Absolutely. and season four which are very rare nowadays because yep. like you know when I, I think it was when god it would have been well odo was playing back in spring and someone tried to lane swap on him and he was saying like oh yeah no i just do this L let me show yes. you how to do this um it, there is a real like value in having people have been through things before there's also you know some value of people getting um a fresh set of eyes and and trying to develop their own way through things because maybe actually they find something on the new meta which is actually more optimized than the way that it was done the last couple of times before that um but yeah when it comes around to this whole conversation in terms of like play your own league of legends a lot of it does come around to also kind of like taking those learnings from veterancy in the past too but also just like finding a way outside of just the imitation of the best teams in the world right now and a couple of teams will do this every year. Typically, they don't come from LEC if they're going to be bottom tier. This is one of the first times I've seen bottom tier LEC teams do this in terms of form their identity. You know, um, for instance, one of the reasons I enjoy watching LPL over a lot of regions is because their bot teams, even if they're they're not good, and trust me, LPL bottom teams, they're fun, but they're not good. No, no. But they will at least try something, and I can appreciate that. Whereas opposed to like LCK bottom tier teams, they, they've, they've, they're the conformers, really. And I think you know, the top tier LCK teams obviously tend to be the best teams in the world. Um, but the, the lower teams uh, just tend to not really add that much in terms of... The no, LCK is the worst for the bottom things. teams, typically, yeah. yeah. And, but, but typically, LEC wasn't that much better either. And, you know, we yes. had teams like... We, we had Rogue, who did struggle in that way. But, yeah, we have actually had teams which have committed to an identity and said, look, while this might not be something which, um, you know, if you gave these three compositions to Gen G, they'll find that this composition is the best, best just because they can play all three compositions very well. But we could only play this one composition, so we'll play that one and we'll master that as well. It's the whole, um, you know, I'd rather... Um, I'd, I'd much rather uh, face someone who's done practice one kick, uh, like a thousand kicks one time than the person who's kicked the one kick 10,000 yes. times instead. Like having a real mastery and that understanding of, of that kind of style of English. This, folks, you, you can probably see over the course of 10 plus le uh, years of YouTube content and whatever else in terms of podcasts, analyzing the game, this will this topic will oh, have come up with yes. every single person doing these podcasts multiple times. 
even just like years apart for themselves. Yes. Hundreds of times we've had this conversation and yet we're having it here again. Congratulations, folk. We've rediscovered the wheel. <laughs> it's why actually it did make sense that for years, Adam's God's champions worked because even when people were like, but this is the count. And this is no, he has played it 1000 times. You've played it three and you've done a theory session. Like you actually don't know you are, you are in danger. You're Ralph Wiggum. You're in danger right now. You <laughs> think you've got the counter, but you haven't. You're, you're going to get bullied. Right. Okay. It was a good episode. We got through it all. We even had some insane theory craft of how G2 comes last place in the season finals, which, by the way, all I'll say, if you want to really tease yourself, is just go and look what the fuck that would do to the championship points. It's that bonkers. So it's funny. actually criminal. So <laughs> I'm not going to leave that out there. I don't think it'll happen. This wasn't Dom. Can, at, least, at least we're not conforming. Yes. Might, it might be a exactly. complete BS yes. by the time the game's have Exactly. Happened, but it's different yes. logic and we're not conforming. We've done it ourselves. Will it be Dom next episode? Let's see. On the next episode of the Best Time League Show period.